Thank you very much. All right, so for this session, uh, we're going to have a little fireside chat here. So I'm going to bring out the other two panelists right away. So Wes and Eliza, why don't you come on out? And clap for them, too. <laughs> All right, so the way this is going to work here, we've got 45 minutes um, to have a conversation. Uh, we're going to start, Wes is going to give a presentation that's going to kind of give some background um, and kind of kind of like what's the lay of the land in terms of renewable energy. And then Eliza and I are going to have a conversation, Wes is going to join in um, about kind of the role of uh, for-profit companies in this area of sustainability and, and in particular in the transition to uh, decarbonizing our energy supply and the kind of steps forward in the industrial environment with, uh, with the companies that we work for. Uh, but there's nothing special about um, the, uh, the companies that are, that are up here right now. So I'm from Owens Corning, Eliza's from Anderson. Uh, there's work going on across all of the companies in the world that are trying to make progress in this area. So we're gonna do our best to represent the work that's going on in, in uh, uh, corporations around the world, but we'll do that in a way of drawing on some specifics so it kind of becomes real, and, and so we'll periodically mention our companies, and it's not in the, uh, the form of, of advertising or bragging or anything like that. It's trying to make the conversation real with, uh, with the work on, that's going on. So, um, so with that, I'm gonna ask each of our panelists, uh, Wes and then Eliza, to introduce themselves, and, uh, and I'll do the same, and then we'll uh, move to Wes's presentation, and then we'll have a little fireside chat. So why don't you start us, start us off, Wes? Okay, hey everybody. So I'm uh, Wes Kennedy, and I'm the kind of dedicated solar hippie of this event. Um, so uh, I first saw a solar panel at a renewable energy fair back in the early 90s, and I was just astounded that basically a shiny rock could turn sunlight into electricity. And so that began a 20 plus year odyssey uh, of, of really working in the solar and energy storage space, uh, uh, installing, running installation companies, working in manufacturing, uh, and most recently uh, in the microgrid space and this kind of emergence of the new grid. Um, so I'm excited to be here today, and uh, you'll get a, a fill of me for about 15 minutes here in just a minute. All right. Eliza? And we're both yogis. We have that connection. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm Eliza Clark. I lead sustainability and community relations for Anderson Corporation. You probably know us as Anderson Windows. Um, Frank asked us to share a little perspective on why we're here today on this stage, and I think for me, uh, it's probably three key reasons. First, obviously, being my role. Um, so at Anderson, I'm responsible for reducing our operational footprint, advancing product sustainability, reducing supply chain risk, and then also philanthropy. And we've had a really significant focus on sustainability in our philanthropic giving for about five years now. Uh, the second is I have been in the corporate sustainability world for about 12 years now. Uh, right when it was really emerging as a field and um, have always been just uh, a, a junkie for green building. So uh, even back as a 20-something, spent a lot of time volunteering my time uh, with the U.S. Green Building Council and um, really craved real case studies. So that's what uh, led me to Anderson. Um, but most recently, helped to found a group called the Sustainable Growth Coalition in Minnesota. It's 35 of the largest companies in Minnesota, and we have aligned around uh, the desire to advance a thriving circular economy, and our um, most significant focus uh, thus far has been on clean energy. Uh, Upinor is another member who is here today. Uh, and the third, I think, has been our commitment to net zero buildings. So we really believe in the power of showing people what's possible. Um, so we've, we've provided free windows when necessary to net zero buildings in a range of applications. Uh, and you can actually see one of those uh, if you're staying for the IBS show with uh, Green Builder Media's Align Project, which is a really cool 
um, very high tech net zero home. Excellent, thank you. Um, and as you heard, I'm Frank O'Brien Bernini with Owens Corning. Um, I, uh, um, you may be the token hippie, but I'm certainly the token former hippie. Uh, <laughs> I, I found and I'm out, not a hippie at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I found out last night that uh, when I was building, yeah. uh, building solar houses in, uh, passive solar houses in Vermont in the mid 70s, Eliza told me last night she was minus four. So, <laughs> so, so I've been Almost at this uh, quite, quite a while. Um, after uh, about three years building passive solar houses um, in southern Vermont, uh, went back to school, got a master's in mechanical engineering, focused on solar design, um, then came to work for Owens Corning. So for 35 years, been working in energy efficiency. Uh, for the last 11 years, um, after my role leading R&D for the company, for the last 11 years, I've been focused full time on, on sustainability and trying to uh, move in, in various ways across the vo very holistic uh, kind of view of sustainability from environmental footprint reduction to sustainable products to wellness, uh, safety, uh, community uh, action, kind of a, a, across the whole sustainability spectrum. But today we're mostly going to focus on the energy side of sustainability, which um, as, as you all know, you've heard different pieces of this today. Um, but while renewable energy is, is a very important tactic in this, um, it's one slice of the pie in the solution to, uh, to the climate challenges. Um, but that is the slice that we're going to focus on in this afternoon session. So with that, I'm going to turn it over and uh, we'll see what Wes has to sort of set the table for our fireside chat here. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, so we've covered a pretty broad topic of, of uh, themes today. Um, and swirling around this whole idea of renewable energy is, has really been one of the, uh, the, the common themes, the strongest themes. And so we may as well just continue with it. So um, really what I want to do is kind of just tell a story. And it's a story that most of us here in this room are going to be familiar with. Um, but I think there's a few key elements that I hope uh, are useful in not only understanding where we've come from and where we're going, but we're at a really interesting inflection point right now. And so this, where we are right now, is kind of where I want to, uh, to share my experience with the group. So we've talked about this quite a bit. If it wasn't such a, not just a national emergency, but a global emergency, I was gonna skip this slide. Um, but climate change, it is upon us. Vast majority of scientific community and hashtag thinking human adults uh, believe that it's us and we gotta do something about it. Oops. Okay, so greenhouse gases. So where do they come from and how do we use them? So basically we've got your main sectors here, electricity production, transportation, and kind of what I will just call the built environment, right? So it's industry, industrial processes, buildings, both homes and, and commercial. Now there's clearly a big slice there of agriculture and that's a whole nother conversation that we won't delve into today. And where these sources primarily come from are, as we've talked about, the fossil fuels, right? So we got coal, we got oil, and we've got in possibly the greatest coup of some PR department of all time, something called natural gas, which uh, uh, I think an alarming amount of people in the US think is somehow a green fuel, um, but it is still a fossil fuel. So how do we use this energy? Well, we use it primarily in these three, what are known as sectors of energy use, right? So transportation, our heating and cooling of our spaces, and then kind of this catch-all that I've called appliances and information, but that also includes, you know, any of these industrial processes. So the first kind of interesting thing I want everybody to wrap their head around is this move towards integrating these three sectors from fossil fuels as the primary driver to electricity, right? So this is known as sector integration. And 
what you're starting to hear more bubble up in the kind of talking points in, in our field is the term decarbonization. And that's really what we're talking about. So it's moving all of these sectors of primary energy to electricity as the, as the base deliverer of the service, and then shifting away from carbon as the, the core uh, source, so to speak. And this is why this matters. So um, it's not just that we want to switch from vanilla to chocolate. It's not just that we don't like coal because it's aesthetically not pleasing. This is a real gains to be made. Uh, this slide is showing a study that was done for an, a typical German household back in 2016. And they said, okay, let's, let's examine what this typical home uses in terms of their energy for transportation, which would probably be a diesel Jetta. Um, their home was probably heated with a natural gas uh, boiler system, and then their other electricity uses of you know, appliances and whatnot. So the exercise took the same level of comfort, but just did this sector integration and this decarbonization study. So replacing diesel with an EV, moving to heat pump technology for heating, moving to state-of-the-art efficiency in appliances. And you could see their primary energy usage was cut in half. So this is a significant change without any change really in their level of comfort or convenience in their life, just by the sector integration. So then the, the key thing to think about then, it's like, okay, I get you, we wanna like move to electricity, but then we've gotta move electricity to renewables. And kind of the uh, rock stars of the renewable world is solar and wind. So this slide shows two of these kind of um, arm in arm tendencies whenever a new technology ramps. And that is as costs drop, production or installation rates go up and vice versa. So they, they feed each other. So what we're seeing here is from when I started in the industry in the late 90s, about a gigawatt of installed capacity of wind and solar, so just a teeny, teeny little fraction. And then in just the span of 18 years, we're up to over a thousand gigawatts of installed capacity. So that's like a thousand fold increase of installed capacity. It's exciting stuff, it's really astonishing. And the other lines here is showing the average price. And we see that solar and wind has been dropping precipitously until this really cool inflection point, which is where we are now, where you know, at that kind of bulk capacity, you know, utility scale for both wind and solar, it is the cheapest form of electricity production that we have. So this is a, an exciting time. So it seems like we've got this thing pretty much licked, right? All we need to do is change everything from fossil fuels to electricity and then produce our electricity with renewables. Ta-da! But there's problems. There's always problems. So it's not just as easy as installing as much solar and wind as we can. And here's some reasons why. First of all, they're inter intermittent resources, right? So the wind doesn't always blow, sun doesn't always shine. So we gotta figure out what to do about that. The other thing we see is, especially in the solar area, uh, this so-called, you know, this mismatch of supply and need. So the big yellow bump there, that's a typical solar production curve. They produce the most power in the middle of the day. But the, the orangish, reddish, purplish thing, that's a typical residential demand curve. So we use power in the morning before solar really starts producing a lot. And we use it in the evening after solar has done being, uh, you know, doing its thing. So this is also another issue that we have to figure out how to deal with. And let's not forget this backbone of our aging grid infrastructure. So we have an old grid that Thomas Edison would recognize, the vast majority of it. We've got centralized power production pushing electricity in one-way directions towards 
all of the homes and businesses and factories. So to couple with this is the grid itself is not really the stable edifice that we can just do whatever we want to and have it survive. So it's a kind of a spongy element. So every time a load, a demand hits the grid, the voltage and frequency will dip. And every time a new source pushes into the grid, the voltage and frequency will rise. So it's kind of like the surface of the balloon there. And our utility companies, they do a wondrous job of providing a very firm resource. The grid works most of the time. So we have to figure out how to deal with intermittency, mismatch of load and demand, and this kind of spongy L, uh, effect of the grid. And that brings us to energy storage. So this is kind of where we're at right now. There's uh, precipitous cost declines in solar and wind have happened. Storage solves much of the problems that, uh, that come from integrating renewables into the grid. And this is kind of this, this inflection point. Now, of many different kinds of storage technologies, electrical batteries are the, at this point in time, are the kind of the clear winning technology. And a couple of key reasons. First thing is, they're very modular. We all have a battery that we carry in our pocket every day. So they can go from the size of a cell phone battery to the size of multiple shipping containers parked in a field somewhere. They're also extremely fast at their job. So this graphic is comparing it to like a traditional natural gas peaker power plant, which when the grid needs power, it takes minutes to provide. But a battery will do that in seconds or in some cases less than a second. And they also, the cool thing about batteries is they're double duty. So they're both a, supply, a, a load when needed, meaning they can absorb power from the grid, and they're a source, so they can give that power back to the grid. So for every battery investment, you're actually getting double capacity as a resource. And then the final point up there is also key, which they're scalable production. So we can't really just go make more Niagara Falls, which is another form of energy storage, but we can make batteries. So this is uh, fueling this whole revolution. So once you get a battery coupled to a solar system, that demand curve looks a little different. What you do is you take the, all that energy that's being produced during the middle of the day and store your battery with it or, or charge your battery with it. And then when you come home, you've got your own energy storage to pull off of. So it turns something that's kind of a stressor on the grid into a resource for the grid. Other solar plus storage benefits is resiliency or backup power. So not all systems do this, but they have the capability to island your house, to run your house when the grid is gone. The other thing that's exciting about storage is it can be used to work with your utility bill to save you money. And that's primarily in two different ways, peak shaving and load shifting. And they're both the same idea, which is just discharging your battery to offset loads. Peak shaving is just when you have a momentary but very expensive peak demand that the utilities charge dearly for. Many commercial rate structures, that's the highest part of their bill, is just this pay paying for these little peak demands. And then load shifting is the same idea, but over the course of more time. So this gives birth to this new grid that is bi-directional. Now you have sources, d uh, distributed energy resources, batteries out on the grid, and everybody's buying and selling into each other. So this new grid is a bi-directional grid. And it becomes the birth of the prosumer. So we're no longer just consumers of power, but we're both a producer and a consumer. 
Where this all leads to is the advent of the so-called smart home. Now this is where what's happening in the energy sector is dovetailing with what's happening in the automa automation and the Alexas of the world, where there are devices that control not just your smart appliances within your home, but manage the charging and discharging of the batteries. So this is an exciting time. So now when you visualize this final, uh, you know, smart home, interconnected appliances, you're uh, managing between your renewable energy source and your energy storage, including your electric vehicle. And now we've got these little smart homes all over the place. The next thing that we can do is interconnect them with another layer of communication. So this is known as aggregation of these resources or the virtual power plant. So I know I kind of sped through a lot of this stuff, but I wanted to get us to this point conceptually. So to, to kind of recap briefly, we shifted all of our energy uses to electricity for the efficiency gain. We replace that electricity with renewable energy. We buffer and stabilize the renewable energy with storage. We interconnect all of our loads and objects and energy storage devices with electronics in our homes. And then we aggregate all of those resources into virtual power plants. So this is where this kind of emerging uh, drive towards 100% renewable. So this is today. Last thing is uh, we're talking about what would it actually look like. So remember that chart I showed you early on where it had from basically the year 2000 to the current time of a thousand fold increase in solar and wind production. So that whole chart would fit just right here of this chart. So that thousand folding increase that feels so radical and so crazy is really the flat part of the curve. <laughs> and this is what it can look like. And this is uh, a study that was done through UC Berkeley taking existing technology. It wasn't trying to imagine some Star Trek era technology on how we could scale to a 100% renewable grid. And the top that represents the big lopping off of the, you know, the top of the curve there is all the efficiency gains from the sector integration and the decarbonization, including one really interesting one. The dark gray is the amount of energy that we save by no longer processing and mining and transporting fossil fuel energy itself. So I find that really fascinating. That's such a big savings. Okay, last slide, we're at a crossroads. We either have the world of chainsaws and monster trucks, the uh, Mad Max world that we've all seen in too many movies, or we've got this place that we can drive to of a sustainable, diverse, green, beautiful place. And as, uh, since it is President's Day, Barack Obama said, the future is ours to win, but to get there, we can't just stand still. Thank you for giving me some time. Thank you very much, Wes. Okay, since, um, you know, uh, uh, about 41% or so of the greenhouse gas emissions that uh, happen in the United States come from the operation of buildings, and some seven, eight, nine percent comes from the actual products that we make, the embodied carbon associated with making the products that go into building those buildings. Um, and then 37 or so percent is, is transportation and the balance is industrial. So from a couple of companies here that, uh, um, that are that balance, uh, we wanna talk a little bit about um, you know, the, the things that we're doing, the things that our peers are doing uh, to make a difference in this space. But first what we wanted to do is uh, um, get y'all moving a little bit, but then also uh, um, with a purpose to see, um, could, could you stand up if you're a builder, designer, 
you know, somebody that, that actually does building projects. So stand up. Woo. All right. All right. We're going we're gonna to build on this. Okay, how about um, product manufacturers? Go ahead and stand up. All right, how about, um, we're, we're getting a good group. How about uh, educators or media, academics, kind of that, that zone? All right, so we've got a few more. How about policy makers or political folks that play in government, government, government affairs? And then because we need to get everybody in on this, how about just have an interest in this topic? <laughs> <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> and if you're sitting down still, uh, or not waving your arms if you have to sit down, uh, then uh, so, so this conversation we want to have um, with you, for you, um, in front of you for sure. But uh, hopefully through this, you'll see in the roles that you have how this can matter uh, through the decisions that you make every day. So, so with that, I'm going to start by asking Eliza, um, you know, wh why is Anderson involved in this? Like, what, what is it about um, this space, and, and in particular, maybe sustainability in general, but in particular, um, the energy space? Um, what, what has the company interested in this? Well, I think for us, it did start with um, the scientific data that buildings were 40% of our uh, worldwide carbon footprint. Um, for more than 100 years, we've been producing energy efficiency solutions for our customers. So um, we've been very committed to the Energy Star program since its inception and have continued to drive towards more and, um, more, and more energy efficient products. The focus on our footprint started um, more recently, probably about 10 years ago. Um, and it started with more of a cost reduction driver, so reducing um, operating costs through energy efficiency improvements, uh, which we've done a lot of amazing things across many of our plants. Uh, but back in 2015, uh, we had a really amazing meeting with all of our executive committee members where we brought a young, um, I think she was 23-year-old architect from one of the large architecture firms in Minnesota. Uh, who was an ambassador for the Climate Reality Project, mm. and she gave her testimonial, storytelling around uh, the growing risks of climate change. Um, and that was a really impactful experience. Many of our executives are very committed to sustainability, but uh, we probably were a culture where we didn't talk about climate change. We talked about energy efficiency and cost reduction. Uh, but that was a very <laughs> transformational moment for us, and um, following that, we signed the Ceres Climate Declaration. Ceres is a group that organizes businesses around um, clean energy policy, uh, and we set our first set of corporate sustainability goals, um, and since that time, we've been working to identify clean energy solutions for our company. Uh, the step that we've taken to date is investing in um, community solar gardens in Minnesota, so that's been a very successful policy tool in Minnesota and Colorado and some other places. Uh, we've subscribed to about 23 megawatts, um, so it's a tool where you essentially subscribe for 25 years. Uh, we have served as the anchor tenant in those gardens, so uh, while we don't own the renewable energy credit, um, but for our participation, those solar gardens would not be in the ground today, so we're, we're proud of that. And then uh, this year, we're actually commencing a pretty significant engagement to look across our portfolio, all of our sites across the US and North America, uh, to determine how we can start to build out that clean energy portfolio using some of the other tools like virtual power purchase agreements. Yeah, the, the Owens Corning story is, is somewhat similar. Uh, you know, we started kind of in the, uh, in the early 2000s when uh, um, kind of two things happened. And w one was a, a marketplace driver when USGBC kind of uh, was first moving out in, in a big way, starting with, uh, with lead building construction. And so we started to see demands in the marketplace um, that is very helpful from all of you to create expectations mm -hmm. for the products that we put in the marketplace. So we began to see the, uh, you know, a, a green product uh, kind of evolution happening and creating, um, you know, both, both pressure and, and opportunity in, in our marketplace. So we had a kind of market driver um, at the same time, uh, concurrent with that 2002 or so, the uh, IPCC 
um, issued one of their reports that, that strongly linked human activity to climate change and had us begin focusing on our, our footprint. And we began in a very sort of traditional way with uh, energy efficiency, kind of driving the, uh, the reduction in energy use to make our products. Uh, and then as we kind of saw the trajectory, the more pressure with the subsequent IPCC reports, um, and, and then certainly with the, uh, um, the two degree and now the one and a half degree sort of max uh, global warming, um, got us very interested in this, the whole idea of science-based target setting to align our goals mm -hmm. with, uh, with climate action. And when, when we did that, it became crystal clear that, uh, that the only path to, uh, to achieving that kind of massive reduction, which for, for us had us setting a, a 50% reduction in greenhouse gas intensity, that the, uh, um, in addition to continued energy efficiency, which for us still is always kind of the cheapest path, um, that we needed to, to layer on renewables in a very big high scale way. And uh, we began doing some sort of iconic 2.5, 2.6 megawatt um, systems co-located with our facilities, but then doing a, uh, a big um, 250 megawatt uh, wind deal that, uh, that brought us about 60% of our, our U.S. electricity in, in renewables. So that gave us an opportunity to play in this in a very big way. So uh, sim similar story, uh, mm -hmm. a little bit different scale, but kind of brought us the same way market-based and then kind of looking at, at responsible production. So Wes, um, the, uh, um, these, these stories you interact with, with companies to help them kind of see their, their path, is, is this kind of similar to what you see elsewhere or do you have anything that you wanna sort of add to uh, how companies are thinking about making progress in this area? Yeah, well I think, uh, so first of all, in, in my own background as of late, I've been working more on the manufacturing side of someplace within that kind of solar value chain. So I uh, worked with, the, at one point, the largest solar inverter manufacturer in the world, so SMA from Germany. Um, and then uh, after those guys, I worked with uh, Fronius, which is an Austrian firm. Um, and both of those companies, I think uh, partly because they were in Europe, which tends to be a little bit further advanced in the US in terms of that whole idea of corporate sustainability, they both had very, um, you know, beautiful, futuristic campuses uh, in, in Europe with, you know, multi-megawatt arrays and green roofs and, and all these things. So um, I, I think that uh, the, the solar industry um, had this kind of commitment to walking its talk internally um, from, from fairly early on. Um, as an aside, and it's actually more of a question back to you guys, one of the things that I started to see were, um, you know, the, just the pure financial returns of solar projects are pretty astounding. I mean, many times greater than 10% and many times much greater than 10%. Um, do you see, like, just, uh, the, just kind of a pure financial, um, we're going to diversify our investment portfolio, own and develop assets that, that happen to be renewables? Is that, is that a thing? Yeah, I can speak to that and sure. then Eliza maybe step in. Um, so we look at it a little bit differently. Uh, we don't own our assets. So what we're not, foc we're not focused on return on investment because it's actually not our investment. So we are looking at um, cost parity or better with grid pricing in our okay. purchase power agreements. So the, uh, the biggest kind of unknown in that space is that uh, we end up signing long-term 20, 25 year purchase power agreements that, that are at a, uh, a fixed or sometimes escalating, depends on where you start, sure. um, pricing. And the biggest unknown in that is, of course, trying to figure out what grid parity will be five years, two years, a month from now. Right. <laughs> Never right. mind 25 years from now. Uh, so the, the biggest conversations in our company tend to be not around uh, return on investment, because again, it's not our investment, but more on the, the certainty of the escalators that are in the deals that, that are available to us. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the um, nose to nose CFO, CSO discussions of, uh, of certainty. And, and in the end, um, you don't know. 
but you also don't know whether you don't do the deal if the escalation is going to put you at a competitive disadvantage because somebody yeah. else is. So, um, so like any business deal, you get all the information possible and you end up making a decision based on that. Sure. So our analysis very much mirrors the, um, what they've done at Owens Corning. I will say the Solar Grodin program is really amazing because we, we get an immediate cost reduction. So within the first year of the program, we saved $100,000, um, which of course our CFO loves. Um, <laughs> but I, I've also been just really astounded at how much better the ROI has gotten. You know, having mm -hmm. done some renewable feasibility studies over the years, it's so much more attractive than it ever was. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I have to say, um, I worry about the complexity of it. If you're not a multi-billion dollar company and don't have a full-time equivalent or a McKinsey consultant uh, or a Harvard Business School mm -hmm. <laughs> grad at the helm full-time working on it, studying it, doing the financial analysis, it's really hard uh, to break into the space. Hmm. Um, I don't know how much time your legal department has devoted to those agreements, but it's very significant. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I, I really think for us to catalyze the next uh, revolution in renewables, we have to figure out how to make it a one, one click step, right? We have, sure. to, we have to hide the complexity to the consumer or just smaller businesses yeah. and make it faster. Yeah, I, I talk with a lot of our peers, and you know, it's the same story. Uh, none of the companies that you know, certainly not Owens Corning, you know, a materials company. Um, certainly, uh, I would guess not not you with uh, with your Windows product line. Um, we we want to be in the business of making the things we make, uh, and we're just in the purchase power agreement zone in here because we can't get it off the grid. I mean, we're yeah. we're committed to footprint reduction. And our only path is essentially through uh, uh, through direct deals for uh, for purchasing power. And same thing with the on-site. I mean, we would love to just be in a position with where our grid operator, um, you know, saw these these curves that you're showing, Wes. Right. Um, that uh, in fact the you know new capacity is cheaper than uh, existing capacity in some cases now in some markets, and uh, and we just offer that right off the uh, right off the grid to us. Yeah. It would be terrific. So if there are any grid supply, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, because I mean, it, it does, it takes a lot of legal time. It takes a lot yeah. of management time. Um, yeah. and, and in the end, uh, people that aren't in the business are placing the bet, which, right. you know, it, certainly the utility should know a lot more about the dynamics than, than product manufacturers. So. Yeah, um, that, you know, that reminds me the, uh, so looping in the complexities around power purchase agreement, contract negotiations, and all mm -hmm. that stuff, you know, that's largely grouped in, in the industry as so-called soft costs, mm -hmm. right, of mm -hmm. development. And, and it's, it's really interesting because globally, the U.S. has the highest soft costs mm -hmm. of developing energy projects. Um, and, you know, we have uh, over 5,000 utilities, and many of the utilities have multiple different rate structures that they can be you know, that, that a consumer can choose. Mm -hmm. um, and so it is just a nightmare at all different levels. So, you know, I would just, uh, I think one big barrier uh, that, that could be reduced should be addressed, and it clearly is, but uh, just to, to talk about it, are those soft costs, mm -hmm. make it simpler. Yeah, so, so we've got a few more minutes here. Um, so I thought what I would do is, is maybe ask uh, the three of us just to um, talk about what, what are the one, two, or three uh, things that, that you think could drive sort of more, better, faster in this space, um, particularly for, for your business. Um, and then if you want to generalize, fine, but like, like what, what are those things that, that if you could wave your wand and say, if I could change this, um, I, I could get more done faster. You want to start, Wes? Um, well, you know, the big one, um, and, uh, General Clark talked about it earlier. Um, really, it's a carbon tax. We really need to monetize mm -hmm. carbon. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that from that will come you know, every other thing. Yeah. Because businesses are set up to optimize around whatever their cost constraints are 
So let's just align our cost constraints with our environmental constraints, and then we're working towards the same goal. Mm -hmm. Good. Eliza? Okay, you said three, so I think I'm going to take three. <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm going to focus on some different things than we've been talking about here today. Um, the first thing is I think we need to diversify our influencers. Mm -hmm. um, if you look out in the audience today, we aren't necessarily a representative of the global population or the U.S. population. Um, to General Clark's point, uh, we need youth engaged, but I think they are engaged, but mm -hmm. we need to, to hear their voices more clearly. Um, secondly, in terms of reducing that complexity, I think that there's a lot of business opportunity in making it a more turnkey experience for business and for consumers. So any entrepreneurs in the audience. Um, and then third, I think we just need to continue learning together. Um, Anderson is about half Owens Corning's size. So we continue to learn um, from businesses that are um, you know, blue chip brands, global corporations that have already hit 100% renewable energy. We're, we share information um, with companies that are smaller than ours. So I think uh, in this case, uh, all ships will rise with the tide. So we have to just keep spreading the message, uh, not just to greenies like ourselves, but, but to the mainstream. Perfect. So I will say that's my number one and my number two, and I'm, I, I do my number three. Yeah, perfect. Uh, so so for, uh, for me, and it's, it's something that, that you all can have a direct impact on, uh, I think what would make the biggest impact on our company doing more, better, faster um, is if we had more direct visibility to the demand associated with lower embodied carbon products. So, so that um, it would encourage us to have more resolve to figure out how to get more renewable energy, more energy efficiency, reduce the embodied carbon of the products that we produced. If we had more confidence um, through sort of direct observation that the actual decision makers that are deciding to put those products into real buildings, because they don't do anything sitting in our warehouses, um, the people made actual decisions based on the environmental product declarations that are, are kind of being demanded by architects and specifiers uh, to, to transparently communicate the embodied carbon or other aspects of products. Um, but if we saw that those were being used for real decision making uh, and that we were winning in some cases and we were losing in others, uh, that would create resolve in our company that, that creates the sort of business case for continued progress in this area. So you all can decide that every day with what you specify in the, in the products that you put into your construction projects, uh, but that would make a big difference for us. So we're at the end of our time. I wanna thank our panelists and thank you for your attention.